Good evening and welcome candidates and you in the audience and those viewing at home. This is the candidate forum for Iowa Senate Districts 37 and 39 and for House District 73. I'm Miriam Timmer, a member of the League of Women Voters of Johnson County and I'll be the moderator for this evening's forum. It's being live streamed on the League's Facebook page and it's being filmed for rebroadcast on the three public education and government channels in Iowa City, Coralville and North Liberty. Please check their websites for their schedules. Additional information about the candidates can be found on the League's vote one, vote411.org website, and we have little bookmarks out there to help you remember that. The League of Women Voters is a volunteer nonpartisan organization that neither supports nor opposes any party or candidate, which is why we have the policy that campaign literature is welcome outside the room following the forum, but no buttons, signs, or literature should be worn or distributed inside this room. The League does, not, does take positions after considerable study of issues, and it acts to influence decision makers on those issues. We work to not only register voters, but also to provide them with information on issues to assist their participation in government. Membership is open to anyone over 16 years of age. Please join us. We can use your time, your talent, and your financial resources. Democracy works best when many people are involved. The views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates. All viable candidates have been invited to participate. The format for this evening is as follows. After candidates have been introduced, they will each have a two minutes for opening remarks. We'll then present questions to them, starting with one from the league, followed by one submitted on cards from you in the audience. League members are distributing cards and pencils for you to write questions on. You can submit as many questions as you wish. You just hold up the card and a league member will come and grab it for you and bring it up to me. Questions that fall in the same general category might be combined. If time does not allow for all questions to be addressed, you may contact the candidates directly after the forum or at another time. It's a nice thing about local politics is it's really easy to get a hold of these guys. Each candidate will have one minute to respond to each question. Due to the time frame, there will not be time for rebuttals and Jan's our timer here. Um, I'll be rotating the speaking order throughout the evening. Tonight we have five candidates running for three seats on the ballot. The Senate seats are four-year terms and the House seats are a two-year term. For Senate District 37, we have Zach Walls, Democrat, and Carl Krambrack, Libertarian. For Senate District 39, we have Kevin Kinney, who's the incumbent and a Democrat, and Heather Orr as a Republican was invited to attend. And for House District 73, we have Jody Clemens, Democrat, and Bobby Kaufman, incumbent Republican. So, Zach, are you ready to start with your opening statement? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Please talk directly into the microphone so you can be heard. Well, good evening, everyone. I want to start by thanking the League of Women Voters for hosting this evening's event, Miriam for, for moderating, and for all of you who are in the audience, both with us in person here at the Coralville Public Library, and those of you who are watching at home, either on the live stream or, or on television. Uh, my name is Zach Walls, and I am honored to be the Democratic nominee for Iowa Senate District 37 to succeed Senator Bob Dvorsky, who I believe is in the audience, uh, who's uh, retiring after a, a distinguished career in the Iowa Senate. Uh, I am uh, somebody who growing up with lesbian parents learned at an early age what it feels like to be uh, left behind or left out. And I know that there are a lot of people in our state who feel that way right now. Uh, a lot of people feel like they're being failed by a broken mental health system. There are a lot of people who feel like our education system is underfunded uh, and that their economic futures are, are dwindling. Uh, and I know that we have an important uh, work in front of the Iowa legislature in 2019 and beyond. Uh, and I decided that I wanted to run for the seat because I want to be a part of that work. Uh, after the video of my speech to the Iowa legislature in 2011 went viral, I knew that I had a choice to make. Do I want to go back to my life as usual or do I want to keep fighting for what I believe in? I chose to fight and I wound up traveling all over our state having tough conversations with people uh, in, in church basements and public libraries and town hall meetings about difficult conversations around marriage equality. And then I wanted to co-found and lead the campaign to end discrimination in the Boy Scouts of America. I fought for people who have been overlooked and who have been pushed aside and I was able to win a lot of these tough fights. And that's exactly what I want to do as your next state senator. We're going to fix our broken health system. We're going to make sure that we're fully funding our education. And we're going to protect working families, including the one in five Iowa children who live beneath the poverty line. 
I will never forget how it feels to be left behind or left out, and I will never forget how hard families like mine had to work to get a seat at this table. I'm very proud to be running, and I hope to win your vote in this election on only 21 days, uh, believe it or not. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Carl Krambeck? I am, uh, oh, this is good. I'm Carl Cranback, and I'm running for State Senate in District 37 as well. I've worked in mechanics, construction, agriculture, and I was the research center supervisor for Hillshire Brands, where we saved the company $14 million a year on their operating costs. I live in Clarence, Iowa with my beautiful wife and two amazing children. I got into biology and genetics uh, because I wanted to help the hungry. I wanted to make the next breakthrough in agriculture that would increase yields and make sure that people no longer <clears throat> died from starvation. Now I get to help people face to face at the medical laboratory in Atomosa. And I consider my running for office as an extension of my dedication to helping people. In healthcare, we have laws and regulations that pre prevent people from helping. We have certificates of need that have nothing to do with patient safety. They only dictate who can open up or expand a health care facility and where. The 15 states that don't have certificates of need pay on average 11% lower health care costs. In Iowa, you can still go to jail or prison for marijuana, even though it's been proven to be safe and effective at treating medical uh, conditions like PTSD. In states that have regulated and taxed marijuana, they have not only seen an increase in revenue and population growth, they have seen a decrease in their opioid epidemics. There are other win-win scenarios for Iowa. We can issue more casino license, legalize sports betting. We can build fourth generation nuclear reactors that can be retrofitted to use cheaper, safer thorium fuels. We can lower government barriers, barriers on workers by reforming occupational licensing requirements, and we can use the new revenue streams from these sources to fund our schools, health care, and environment without raising taxes a dime. Thank you. All right, Kevin Kinney is running for Senate District 39. <clears throat> Thank you to the League of Women Voters and everyone here that is present. Uh, I want to thank the other candidates uh, for being here. Uh, unfortunately, my candidate uh, that I'm running against uh, has not uh, or did not show up. And I think it's a shame because I think there's needs to, we need to be able to look at the differences between us and give you um, the ability to choose between us. I entered office promising to work across the aisle to get things done, and I have. Human trafficking with Craig Paulson, who is the Speaker of the House, Narcan legislation with Representative Klein. Other examples are the industrial hemp with Senator Capuchion. We couldn't get over the line this year through both chambers, and I'm looking forward to continuing to work on this next year, in my second term. To me, this is a way we can create jobs in rural Iowa and give farmers an alternative crop in which they can produce. It has been a pleasure working for you, and I uh, am looking forward to your questions. All right. Jody Clemens is running for House District 73. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for all being here tonight uh, and taking time out of your schedule. Um, I'm from the West Branch area. I've lived there um, since I was born. Um, my husband is here with me today. We actually started off as teen parents, and uh, you know, I don't think there has been more than a six-month stretch at a time since that day that we found out we were expecting our daughter where we haven't been learning how to roll with the punches and doing whatever needed done to get us through to that next, to that next level. Um, 
running for office was never something that I ever thought would be in my future. Definitely not on any bucket list of mine. Um, my candidacy was uh, born after 2016 out of my frustration with our current political climate. We have gone from not being able to discuss politics with each other to not being able to talk to each other at all because of politics. I'm seeing families ripped apart. Um, our conversations you know, have gotten so divisive over the last couple years. Um, also, my desire to engage, to get more citizens engaged in the local and state political um, political um, levels, just trying to take people to the Capitol to fight for issues that they care about, how to get people more engaged, learn about their city council, their county government, their state house. Um, I honestly believe that the worst thing that happened in Iowa was not Trump winning in 2016. It was granting a trifecta in the Iowa state house, and it allowed, when there was the opportunity to do so many good things, and then we saw them coming down on things like work comp when we already had a great system in place, collective bargaining rights for public employees. Um, I believe that, uh, you know, we, we need to get the balance back to the people to where we're representing our districts and not just trying to pass things that are coming through from other states. Um, I am fighting hard to get money out of politics as well. I am proud to have run a campaign without accepting any PAC money. We have received almost a thousand individual donations as of this last filing date. Um, it is possible to run a campaign without money. It is possible to run a civil campaign where you do not need to attack each other. And so I hope to be your next representative, District 73 and thank you all so much for being here. And Bobby Kaufman is House District 73 as well. Good evening, everyone, and thank you also to the League for having us. Um, this is my third term that I have completed, and I'm running for a fourth, and so I've got a track record, and I've got a track record that I'm proud of. When I sat here six years ago, I, like Senator Kenney, said that I was going to work in a bipartisan manner, and I have delivered that emphatically, because I have the most independent voting record in the state of Iowa in the last six years, and I do have a track record of accomplishments that do come from our district. A few highlights from the last couple of years. There's a dire need for EMS funding in our small towns. I was able to floor manage and work with the other party to make sure that we have a possibility of $10 million per year in federal funds coming in for our EMS officials. As I chair the Government Oversight Committee, I sat in horror and watched as two tragedies impacted two little girls in West Des Moines as they were killed as special need kids in adoptive care. That system was broken. We immediately got together, not as Democrats and Republicans, but as people who were worried about little girls who were being killed by people that are, have unconscionable thoughts. And we were able to meet within one day, come up with a solution to make sure that anybody else that's in adoptive care will have to make sure they are seeing, they're putting that child in front of a mandatory reporter. You look at bills on mental health, opioids, and holding the MCOs accountable. Those all passed last year with every single Republican and every single Democrat in each chamber voting for it. Also, what it's, I think the job of representative is to help to stop bills that are not good for the district. The vouchers bill that would have harmed our public schools, I was a strong vocal opponent of it, and we were able to defeat that. There was a small effort by a couple people uh, to attempt to reform IPERS. I am vehemently and adamantly opposed to that. Your retirement is 100% solvent. We have one of the best retirement systems in the state, and we were able to put that to rest. And then finally, one bill that's very near and dear to my heart that we got past the House that did not pass the Senate that I'm going to make sure does next year. We were all just stunned when it didn't, and that was when the SAVE bill passed the Iowa House for the penny sales tax extension for our schools, 97 to 2, just to see some people in my party obstructed in the Senate. So with that, I appreciate everyone being here and look forward to all of your questions. Thank you. The first question is from the League of Women Voters. What specific ideas do you have for bringing rural and urban communities together to solve water quality issues? And we'll start with Zach when you're ready. And we have one minute to respond. <clears throat> when, when we launched this campaign in uh, December of last year, the three kind of top issues that we were focused on were health care, education, and workers' rights. But as we got out into the community, started holding meet and greets, knocking on doors, water quality started coming up over and over and over again. Uh, and one of the things that became clear to me is that there is a real gap uh, between our urban and rural areas in terms of where the responsibility lies for this problem. Uh, I've spoken with plenty of folks here uh, in, in Coralville and in Iowa City uh, who point the finger squarely at our farmers, 
And I've spoken with farmers who point the finger squarely at folks who are here in our urban areas who are putting too much fertilizer on their lawns or on their golf courses. And so I think that one of the things that we have to do is bring people together to talk about what the actual causes of the problem are. I think that we have to realize that this is something that we all care about, and so we're all going to have to work together to fix. Uh, there are going to be a lot of things, uh, including you know more cost share for conservation projects. Uh, there might be some uh, things looking at making sure that we're using a, an appropriate amount of fertilizer uh, and some of the other chemicals that are being applied to our fields. Uh, but again, at the end of the day, we really got to work hand in hand with our farmers uh, and with the folks who are, are here in our cities, uh, you know, who want to take care of their lawns too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Carl Krambeck. So the nitrogen uh, problem is really what uh, the water quality issue boils down to. And uh, with w nitrogen, um, we've had a couple research uh, projects uh, throughout the years that have been able to tackle this. So that's uh, nitrogen fixation in corn is a really big one. Um, you can do that through either nodulation. They have an aerial root system down in Mexico that you can actually utilize as well. But I would rather spend millions of dollars on research and development of newer technology that can make it easier for corn to fixate nitrogen than to spend billions on water quality issues that are kind of just band-aids uh, to the issue. And then with uh, CAFOs, I do think uh, research into the feed to weight ratio of uh, animals is a good thing to look at, whatever, you know. Uh, nitrogen that they have as well can be lowered and you can grow more meat on less land if we put money into that type of research. So that's uh, mostly what I'm looking at. Thank you. Kevin Kinney. This has been an, an issue. It's been an issue in which we have uh, been working on. Uh, it's an issue that uh, we need to educate each other. Uh, the last couple of years, I've had meetings with uh, Brenham and Pork bringing in legislators and, and people from the public, and our Stutzmans have, are going down there and setting up a day where uh, we're talking about precision agriculture and placing the fertilizer where it's needed. Uh, one, of, one of the things that uh, we need to continue to do uh, is fund the Leopold Center. Uh, that was something that uh, uh, was cut a few years ago, and the and and we need to look at the, the research that's coming out of there. Cover crops is where uh, that uh, that was looked at, and, and that's where that kind of was born. Uh, it uh, the the different ways farmers uh, have and do the, their farming practices. Thank you, Jody Clemens. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I think that, uh, you know, this very much is an issue of rural versus urban in a lot of ways in that um, we are going to keep arguing back and forth forever on is it lawn fertilizers that's doing it, is it farms that's doing it. I would like to see some pilot projects started out in small watersheds. Lake McBride would be a prime example of a smaller watershed where we could try to do a moratorium on lawn chemicals for, you know, a period of time, measure that, see how much of an impact that is making versus some of the other chemicals that are coming off of the, the farms in the area. Um, I would like to see some more innovative um, options with waste treatment in our small rural communities. They are being they're looking at a lot of them having to upgrade at the tune of three to four million dollars and there are other um, less expensive um, options being investigated right now like putting tree roots in their in their um, holding tanks on that is actually has some very promising results but they're going to need an extension of time to be able to uh, see if that can can pull through before they're forced to put in those large treatment plants so I think we need more innovation and we definitely uh, need to keep working together. And Bob Kaufman? As a farmer, I'm programmed to when I see a problem looking for a solution. And so last year we put forth a great first step in passing a water quality bill that will invest $23 million per year for the next 10 years that will go towards pilot projects, that will go towards innovative, uh, measurable situations where we can see what the best plans are. But I also have uh, been a vocal uh, proponent of the I will uh, bill. I actually proposed uh, with 10 Democrats and 10 Republicans the single largest investment in water quality in the history of the state of Iowa. Bills with big ideas. Des Moines is full of raging incrementalism, and that kind of drives me crazy sometimes. And so sometimes big ideas take time, but I'm willing to put forth those big ideas, and I have put forth that big idea when it comes to water quality to the tune of a record investment. Thank you very much. 
Our next question from the audience. Would you support efforts to limit civil asset forfeiture in Iowa, including potentially ending equitable sharing practices with the federal agencies? And we'll start with Carl. Um, so I think when you're uh, uh, doing things like that, you have to look at what's uh, public versus private. If it's benefiting a private company, I'm not uh, really for um, uh, for any of those practices, I, I I don't think that you know pipelines or anything like that should have been uh, uh, laid down because those are benefiting private companies. They're not benefiting uh, roads or bridges or anything that's uh, kind of a p common public utility. So I do think we should limit that um, uh, with civil asset forfeiture, uh, bare minimum. Thank you, Kevin. Well, your asset forfeiture, I'm looking at this more in the, the law enforcement where you're actually forfeiting money that has been seized or drugs that have uh, uh, the, the, the fruits of a crime. Uh, I am a proponent of law enforcement uh, doing this. It uh, has um, funded our DARE programs, uh, many other programs that that we have here in, within our counties th that I serve. Uh, should there be oversight? Yes, there should be uh, government oversight on that. Uh, but uh, when we're working with and doing af asset forfeiture with uh, the federal government, uh, so many times the federal government is the one that is seizing it, doing the forfeiture, and then they, they spread the money out uh, equally among the partners. Uh. All right, thank you. Jody? Um, so I will address both of the variations there. Um, so as far as civil asset forfeiture, um, like you say, in law enforcement, um, I do think that there needs to be a, a, a clear path to getting the assets back if you're found innocent. Um, I also believe that, you know, as, as well as Carl said, you know, imminent domain, I believe, is what he was speaking to. And I do believe that private corporations should not have the ability to take away your, your um, private property. Um, but for public utilities, there are some instances if it's not going to um, take farmland off the market, et cetera, that I would consider it. Thank you. And Bob? Well, since it was brought up, I'm sure it'll shock every Johnson County legislator in the room that I'll go ahead and touch base on eminent domain because it is now illegal for a private company to seize private property because I ran that bill successfully and it passed unanimously. When it comes to civil asset forfeiture, when it comes to police efforts, um, I actually chaired the Legislative Oversight Committee hearing on civil asset forfeiture. We brought in people from the federal and the state government. We had a large uh, police presence with state troopers, with county sheriffs, deputies, and we had the folks that are, are uh, proponents of civil asset forfeiture reform. I think that we had an incredibly productive conversation. We put forth some recommendations. Only a few uh, were taken up and passed. I think there's more uh, work to be done on this issue, but I have led the way to making sure the conversation is had so it's not a you know victim versus the police. I think that we can all have this conversation together, and I've proven that we can do that civilly. Thank you. And Zach? I, I do think it is important to have limits on civil asset forfeiture. Uh, it, is, it is not uncommon to have some of those assets seized before an actual trial takes place. And so I think it is make, it's very important to make sure uh, that we're not depriving innocent people of, of their property. Um, you know, at the same time, I know that there are some uh, departments that do depend on, on those assets that are seized from people who are guilty of, of committing sometimes many crimes. Uh, and when that's the case, I, I think that that makes sense. Uh, but I do think it is important that we have limits to make sure that uh, we don't have needless interference in people's lives, especially if they have not committed any crime. Thank you. The Democrats claim education funding is being reduced. Republicans say education funding is increasing. Which is it? Can you explain? And what, how do libertarians feel about it? <laughs> Me again? Oh, or, sorry. Are we? It's Kevin. Me, Kevin, I'm so sorry. <laughs> what do <a> libertarians? <laughs> well, <laughs> the state is paying out more money uh, for education, but it's not new money. It, it's it's money that has been uh, shuffled. It, it, it's money that when the, the the counties were running and had the the silos. Program or save, uh, 
the money was then reverted to the state, and the state has taken over that program. So the state is paying out more money. That is a true statement. But the money itself is coming from programs that were already in place. Some of the, some of the other programs like that are, are the, uh, uh, I can't think of the name of it right now. Um, there is one other federal program that has switched, and it, uh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on it. Mm -hmm. But it, it uh, but it's, it is uh, a program, or these programs have increased. Uh, it has increased over the last eight years by 0.007%, I believe, with new money. Um, I think that uh, when we're talking about percentages of the total budget going to it, when our revenues have been down, it's not a fair um, measure of how much money is going to public schools. And also when they're saying that they're putting the new funding in, I agree with Kevin that a lot of that is the Pebble and Save money that has been coming that was formerly in the counties and now is at the state level. Um, but the bottom line is it's not enough. It's not enough to keep with, infl uh, with the inflation that our schools are facing. It's not enough to give teachers raises. And it is not enough to keep up with the rising cost of health care. So we either need to do something about wages, do something about health care, or we've got to raise taxes to make sure that our schools can be fully funded in this state. A few facts. $715 million in the last 10 years. That is the amount of non-pebble non and non-save dollars that have gone to our K-12 public, public schools. $715 million in allowable growth. According to the Cedar Rapids Gazette, who is never going to be mistaken for a conservative bastion, Iowa is number three in the entire United States of America for increased funding since 2010 to education. Those are facts. You also look at the percentage of our budget, which is very fair to talk about, because it shows where your dedication is. And when we write a check last year for $3.2 billion, which is 42% of our state budget, and that goes to K-12 through public schools, that's an absolute fair measurement of what our priorities are, and it shows that education is number one. And then finally, when it comes to education funding, there are other funds that are important, which is why I'm so passionate about pushing the SAVE bill, why I'm pushing for more in funding for transportation equities, and why I believe the vouchers bill was bad for this state. So I've got a track record on education, and I'm proud to stand behind it. Thank you. Zach? Miriam, it's a great question, uh, and I think it's a great example of why so many people are frustrated with politics right now. The reality is that if you look at eight of the last 10 years, uh, they are the lowest increases in our allowable growth for our K-12 schools on record. And if you look at our higher education, we've pulled out almost $100 million over the last decade. So uh, if you're going to say that education funding is up, it's true. There is there is there some uh, there are some increases that are happening, but they are small increases. And when you look at our higher education, our border region schools, our community colleges, money is being being pulled out of the system, and and that's a, a huge problem because if you look now you're seeing uh, Iowa State University, University of Iowa, they want to raise tuition, uh, and when that happens, it's going to make it more difficult for for students, whether you're a first generation college student or someone who's comes from a, a long line of college graduates, to go to college, and that has to be a big priority. Uh, and so you know when when I was growing up, you know the K-12 schools in Iowa were you know top two, top three in the country. Uh, today we're, we're moving towards the middle of the pack, and so it's, it, that's not just a question of funding. But when 80% of your, your spending from, from an, your average school district is going to payroll, if you can't keep up in terms of funding, making sure those teachers get those salaries, we're going to lose those teachers to other states that are going to be willing to pay more. And Carl. All right. Uh, so, yeah, funding has has increased, but I think, you know, voters are frustrated with the, the percentages and, and, you know, moving the numbers around, you can kind of highlight it uh, one way or another. But uh, to fund anything, you have to be able to bring in new revenue streams, and I think that is a big part of uh, my campaign, is laying out a, uh, a long uh, stretch of ways that we can bring in new revenue to uh, increase education funding. Um, and I think I've done that quite now well. With the SAVE bill, um, I, d I do think that the you know limitations on the money that the school gets, we could we could look at that because some, you know, instead of infrastructure, they could, uh, they may not need a, a an increase in infrastructure. They may need an increase in another aspect of their individual schools. So bringing a little more local control to that is also a, a pretty good idea. But you have to be able to uh, uh, fund the things with new revenue streams. Thank you. 
Public employees across the state are seeing their contracts gutted. Do you support reinstating protections for workers under Chapter 20? Why or why not? And we'll start with Jody. Absolutely. Um, I think this is one of the worst bills that went through the legislature when they were going to tweak collective bargaining and they literally stripped it down to the bare bones of our public employees. Um, we already have, um, they're already, funding is being cut to so many of these public programs. Employees are already taking on more um, more at, at their jobs and to take away their collective bargaining rights as well. Um, I think it really comes down to health care, the rising cost of health care. I understand that employees want their health care as well. And, you know, I I think we need to fix that instead of punishing the employees on all the other aspects that they're able to negotiate on. And I will absolutely fight to restore collective bargaining to our public employees. It's not just about teachers. I know that that gets highlighted a lot. It's our DOT. It's our secondary roads. It's so many other people that are now not able to bargain for their, for their rights at work. Thank you. Well, I, I disagree with the way the question was phrased. I disagree with the premise of the question, and I disagree with the notion that it's somehow an attack on teachers or workers, because that's just simply not accurate. I have seven public school teachers in my immediate family. I wouldn't have voted for a bill that's going to, in the end, harm them. I have knocked on over 6,000 doors in the last six weeks alone. I have talked to countless public workers. Because Jody's right, it's not just teachers. It's DOT workers. It's those the DNR. It is countless and thousands of people. Not one human being outside of the political echo chambers has brought this bill up to me. Not one. I'm not saying there are people that don't have problems with it. I'm not saying there are people that are being fed myth truths about what the bill is going to actually do, because that's very accurate. But as far as representing my district, I have the support of hundreds and hundreds of public school teachers, of workers. I think the bill in the end is going to be a good thing. I think you're going to see people that were never desert, that were never able to receive raises for their good work. They were forced to get the entire raise that everybody else was going to get. You're going to see those reins relinquished. And I think it's a good bill, and I supported it. Thank you. Yeah, I support uh, the full reinstatement of Chapter 20 collective bargaining rights. Uh, I support it for, for a very simple reason, which is that state employees are telling me that it is adversely affecting them. And it's not just uh, workers either. It's also people who are in management. Uh, just uh, about a week and a half ago, I was in Clarence. Uh, I met with the mayor there, who's actually a Republican. Uh, he oversees uh, some of the public operations that the, the town and the county do. And he told me that he was really worried about the changes to Chapter 20. This is uh, not somebody who's, uh, you know, I don't think probably going to be voting for me, uh, but he said he was really worried about about it, you know, he used he had been a frontline public uh, sector employee. That uh, he knew how important those contracts are, and he was worried about uh, the fact that even though now he's in management, uh, some of the guys that he used to work with think that they're going to be adversely affected by it. So, uh, the people I've spoken with have have said something slightly different than what Representative Kaufman's heard, uh, and so I think that we got to give uh, the folks uh, the more the protection that they had. You know, it, it wasn't broken before, so uh, there's no reason to, to change the bill. Uh, and I think it's uh, it's really unfortunate that we're in a position where. Uh, public sector workers were told one thing and, and got another. Carl? Um, so I, I would reinstate collective bargaining. Um, I, I, I think it's uh, good enough to uh, know that they feel that they're not being listened to as much uh, as what I, I typically hear from people. And um, a lot of the times they weren't really bargaining for just saying, hey, give me more money. They were saying, let's take the money that we have and we'll utilize it in a different way. So as far as, uh, like Jody brought up, uh, health care costs, I, uh, ending certificate of, of need that would uh, uh, benefit uh, that uh, aspect of uh, Iowa health care. Um, uh, states that do not have uh, certificates of need have typically 11% lower health care costs. So that can uh, help s uh, uh, stem that, and that's what most of the people who I've talked to were really bargaining for is uh, uh, different or better health care. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Kevin? I would reinstate uh, Chapter 20. I would, it was a bill that was told to me that was going to be a tweak. This was much more than a tweak. Were there things that I thought could be fixed in Chapter 20, the ability to pay when you went to arbitration for the, the uh, government agency? Uh, yeah, there was things that, that could have been worked on, but we gutted it. And now we have a two-tier system, even in Iowa, for law enforcement. We have uh, people at the, at the Department of Public Safety 
that uh, don't, don't have the same rights as the Sheriff's Department or the Corville or Iowa City Police Department. Uh, when I was in charge of the task force, those uh, officers did the same thing that I asked any other officer. It was the same job. We have sheriff's departments that do, do not qualify now across the state because their pool isn't big enough. Uh, we have just created uh, a mess, and we need to go back and uh, work on fixing it. All right. We're ready for the next question, right? Okay. And then who starts this time? Are we Bob? Thank Bobby. you. What is the role of legislators in women's health care decisions in pregnancy? I mean, <laughs> is there a specific bill that you want me to reference? Because I obviously am not going to answer a question that's framed that way. If you want to know about the heartbeat bill, which I guess is the premise of it, if you want to know about the heartbeat bill, which I assume is the premise of it, um, I had hundreds of women in my district that came to me, and there were also people that were opposed. And they said, we believe that just like you measure the death of a human being by the lack of a heartbeat, you also measure the life of a human being by a heartbeat. And they said, please stand up for the hundreds of women who, if this bill didn't pass, would never have the right to come to a forum like this and ask these questions. And so either way I voted, you were going to make a group of women mad. But to frame this question as an attack on women, as the heartbeat bill is an attack on women, is not accurate because a woman ran it in the Senate, a woman ran it in the House, a woman let it out of the House of the Representatives, a woman signed it, and hundreds of women in my district asked me to vote for it. So a lot of times in politics you have to make tough decisions. That was one of them, and that's why I voted that way. Zach? There isn't one. Do you want to elaborate on that? Or? I don't think I don't think you had to elaborate on it. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so first of all, I'd like to say, you know, there's there's good people on both sides of this issue. I, I don't think that we need to vilify people for believing one way or another. But um, as a, as a libertarian, I believe in looking at the outcomes of a bill and not the intentions of a bill. I would never advocate for abortion. I would never uh, go out and tell somebody to have one or not. Um, but if you look at the intention of the bill, the intention is to lower abortions. And I don't believe that the bill has done that. If you want an abortion, you simply travel to another state. And that's why I would uh, have opposed the heartbeat bill. Um, things like over-the-counter birth control, things like uh, making adoption a little easier for other options for women to have when they uh, are going in through that situation, and uh, making sure that all the rape kits in the state are tested. For us to have thousands of rape kits not tested is just wrong. Thank you. Kevin? This is a is something that uh, I struggled with. It uh, is something that when it comes down to it, it's, it's a woman's choice. One of the things that I did when I went to the sheriff's office 30-some years ago is I began investigating all the, the sexual assault cases. And when you sit in a hospital ER with a 12-year-old child who has been sexually assaulted, and you're telling that person that they are pregnant, it's not my choice as a legislator to tell that 12-year-old that they have to have an abortion or not. It is their choice, and it should be the woman's choice. Women can hurt women, too. I am tired of hearing that this bill, since it was run by women in the House and the Senate and the governor, that that makes it OK. Um, I would like to know why the hundreds of women that reached out to you and asked you to pass this bill superseded the dozens that have poured out their hearts to you to be told that you would absolutely never vote on a bill that it's would come accurate. through the House. It's not accurate. They have shared emails with me. You can reach out to people. People messaged you over and over again. We have you on camera saying that you would never tell a woman what to do with her it's body. It's not accurate. 
Single women voters go to the forums, re watch, watch the former forums. Um, I am furious as a woman who has made that choice, who has had to stare at that positive pregnancy test and think about 18 years into the future, was I able to provide for her, what that was going to do to my future? I would never tell another woman how to make that decision. And I think we absolutely need to reverse that bill if the Supreme Court doesn't do it for us first. Iowa wind turbines produce large amounts of electricity. Can the electricity be used to produce jobs in rural Iowans? For rural Iowans, sorry. Yeah, well, and look, uh, Iowa's a, a national leader when it comes to wind energy. 38% of all electricity generated in Iowa comes from, from wind. Uh, and what that does is, yes, it absolutely does create jobs. You have wind technicians, people who are building these wind turbines. If you drive along Interstate 80, uh, you'll see wind turbines uh, in you either direction you go. Uh, I think that there's more, I mean, I would love to see even more wind turbines coming online. I think that we need more in, in, when it comes to solar. Uh, and I think that one of the big things that we have to start making some, some investments in uh, is our, our batteries, making sure that we can store uh, this electricity so when it's not windy out, we're able to build up these batteries uh, so that we have that, that base load of energy available. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, not only that, uh, wind turbines are also creating a lot of income streams for folks who, uh, who are in rural communities. Uh, and, you know, that income can be used to support families, uh, to make sure that schools are getting the money they need. So uh, wind energy is great. And I, I'm, I'm glad that Iowa is a leader. And, and uh, I think that it's a, a leadership role that we have to continue. Yeah, Carl, and please remember to speak directly into the mic. Thanks. Oh, okay. Um, so wind and solar, they're, they're, I, I see them as kind of a way for people to gain independence from energy companies. But right now, what happens is we give our tax dollars in, and then the energy companies take it, and then they set up the windmills for us, as opposed to us uh, putting them on our house and putting them next to our house. And uh, I'm not fully for that. I don't think it should be commercialized in that way. But uh, I do believe that there's other technologies out there. So uh, molten salt reactors, thorium reactors are uh, one of the most revolutionary fourth generation nuclear technologies out there that can provide cheaper, cleaner, safer energy and are uh, walk away safe. So if you take uh, everybody out of a normal nuclear uh, facility, the facility will melt down. But if you take everybody out of one of these reactors, it will slow slowly, slowly shut down with no harm done. So that's uh, where we should move in the future. Kevin? I think that uh, this has been a boon to our economy. It has it, it, it uh, created many jobs here in Iowa. Uh, we have kids that are going, and I've got two neighbor kids that are now working on the turbines. and. Making a good wage, and they're both living in rural Iowa. Uh, it is uh, a boost to our, our taxable uh, income, or the, the property taxes for the counties, uh, the, for the turbines. Uh, I think that uh, it's renewable, it's green, and it's clean. I agree. I'm a big proponent of uh, solar and wind energy, and I've actually been doing a lot of research on Carl's suggestion as well on the nuclear. Thanks for all the links. Um, I think whatever we can do to, to um, lower our reliance on fossil fuels, we have got to take climate change seriously. Um, you know, scientists keep moving up that clock as to when it's going to be too late for us to do something, and it can't just be about the money. It has to be about our future. What kind of planet are we leaving for our kids if we don't start to take this seriously and realize that every one of us needs to start to make a difference. Before I answer the wind question, I was accused of something, and I'm going to respond. What a bill is called in the beginning process in one chamber, what its content becomes as it evolves, and what the ending product is wildly varies from huge swings. I have never said I would vote for something or not vote for something and then did it, period. When it comes to wind energy, I support wind, I support solar, I support geothermal. I did that before it was popular. I put geothermal in my house back in 2008. I've been putting solar on my farm since 2004. I support all of those, but I want to make it clear that we should not be supporting them while also giving away our constitutional rights. And the Democratic Party at best June put support for the Rock Island Clean Line back in the state plat party platform. That is a private company, which is an oil company, by the way, from Texas. 
Attempt, attempting to make the single biggest property rights seizure in the history of the state of Iowa cloaked in the friendly flag of wind. So while I support it, I want to make sure that we're crystal clear that you cannot invade on our constitutional rights while doing it. Okay. Um, I'm going to read the whole question. I provide home intervention and education to children aged birth to three who have disabilities and developmental delays. Much of my service area is in Washington County. Families there are being told they can no longer fill prescriptions or get medical equipment at local pharmacies because these pharmacies have stopped accepting Medicaid. What is your vision for fixing the disaster that is Medicaid? And we're starting with Carl, correct? Um, so, so I was never a big fan of privatization. I, I think that companies need to earn your money, not uh, uh, have a politician give it to them. Um, that being said, I, I do think there is a, a slight benefit when it comes to the poor for saving money. I think that preventative care they have and privatization they have shown to save us money on that. But the uh, those that are uh, uh, elderly or those that have a long-term disability, those companies can't save us money on those people. The only way they can save money with those particular groups of people is by denying coverage. And I, I don't think that it was, uh, it, it's obviously not intentional. Nobody knew how this bill would work out. Uh, people saying, you know, oh, privatization way back when was going to be, you know, bad or good. They, you know, we, we needed to see how the bill worked out before we could actually try and find ways to fix it. And I think we're, we're ready to tweak it in proper ways. Kevin? Well, the, the MCOs have cost many of people in Iowa their jobs. Uh, because the MCOs have not been paying for services which the, the different providers have provided. One of the things that uh, we could do is we could go back in, and I think we should take over the long-term care patients. We have had MCOs that are running some of the children's programs that were working fine. Those were people that uh, the, the checkups and, and, and a lot of the, the services uh, for uh, keeping you healthy were, were, uh, were done. And those, that's a, a group of individuals that we need those types of, of, of services. So I think it could be doing both, <coughs> keeping the MCOs, but, but the state taking back the long-term care patients. I think the most frustrating thing for me about the Medicaid um, privatization is that we, almost every single person on the patient care side of things that I have talked to has seen a negative impact of this. I am hearing from families all the time that their their loved ones are being, uh, their group homes are being shut down. I have little kids that can't get in to see a dentist because so many aren't taking Medicaid anymore because they're not getting paid. There are major problems with this system, and it's okay. We don't have to blame, you know, we don't have to blame who did it. He's in China right now. But admit that there's problems so that we can so that we can get it back to where it needs to be, into the state run where there should be no profit involved. Um, you know, and, and as they're finding out, they can't make profit on this. And we'll just continue dumping more money into it until we get it back into a state run program. Well, I think few people are not admitting that there are things going wrong because there clearly are. I didn't vote for Medicaid privatization. It was done by administrative rule several years ago. But people also need to acknowledge that the old system was on a train wreck towards non-solvency. The old system was increasing in just the increased costs by over $115 million per year. That's our entire judicial budget for the entire state of Iowa was just the increases per year. So doing nothing or just simply taking the whole thing back to the old system doesn't work either. We did pass unanimously with Democrats and Republicans voting for it in both chambers some MCO reform language because the MCOs need to be reminded that we're in charge, not them. Absolutely. And that language did pass and get put in their contracts. But I think the, I think the solution lies, actually I completely agree with Senator Kinney, I've been saying this for a while, putting our long-term folks in the highest needs where there is no money to be saved back on the state rolls and putting the rest of it under the MCO control with reforms and with checks, I think could provide that balance away from the old system and the new system. 
I think one of the most important qualities in a legislator is the ability to admit when a mistake was made and taking action to correct the mistake when there's a mistake that has to be fixed. Medicaid privatization is clearly one of those mistakes. Representative Kaufman is right. Uh, this was not something that was passed by the legislator. It was done by executive fiat by former Governor Terry Branstad. But the legislature does have a responsibility to fix this problem if the governor won't. Uh, the reality is that Medicaid privatization is a disaster. It is failing patients. It is failing providers. It is having devastating impacts in communities, and it's affecting people like the woman who asked the question tonight. Uh, I, I think it's really important that we make sure uh, that the providers who are doing this work are being compensated. Uh, we may not be able to fully reverse Medicaid privatization, but I think at this point we have to try. If that isn't possible, we absolutely should carve out portions of the long-term uh, chronic care population, some folks who have intellectual disabilities. Uh, there are things that we can do, but, uh, but where we are currently clearly isn't working. Uh, but rather than holding the MCOs accountable, last year, Governor Reynolds, uh, this year, Governor Reynolds gave the MCOs a 7.5% raise for the job that they're doing. Uh, that's the wrong direction. Uh, we have to get moving in the right direction. Right. Do we start with Carl this time? I don't know why I always mix Thank up you with you. Yeah, You've answered the question, right? Yeah. Yes. All right. Um, and then can we talk about long-term mental health issues as well? Do you think that we need to open more long-term mental health facilities in Iowa? Or what else can we do about mental health issues? We start with Kevin, right? One of the, the, the things that happened with the mental health is uh, we began shutting down our state-run institutions. This is some th place where they had to accept patients. When you're transporting a patient across the state of Iowa and there's a behavioral problem and the sheriff's office, once they get there, has no place to, and, and they refuse that person, there is no place for that patient to go. One of the things with the uh, dual diagnostic center in Mount Pleasant was it was not only treating a substance abuse problem, it was treating a mental health problem. So many of these patients have multiple diagnoses and we should be treating those patients in a facility that will accept these people. We, we are very, uh, we have really put this group of, of people, uh, we have neglected them. We are filling our jails with, with uh, individuals that have mental health problems. Our prisons and jails have become the largest mental health institutions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I am I'm very glad that we got the complex needs bill. Um, perfect example of how private citizens can help lead legislation with the carpenters here in this area. Uh, I would like to see that funded from the state level instead of having to raise property taxes in our counties when people are already on fixed incomes or feeling the crunch there. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm so hopeful on this issue because at least all sides agree that mental health is one of the biggest problems facing us right now. I would like to see early intervention in the schools. I would like to see mental health providers in our school system for early diagnosis and early treatment. Um, and I would like to see uh, us all come together and recognize that financial stressors contribute so much to the mental health of our society. We have to make sure that we are treating the entire person, not just um, the medical side. Thank you. Well, Senator Kinney is exactly right. The pro biggest problem we have is our hospitals and our prisons are being treated like mental health wards. Uh, last year, we put a good first step, and it was just a first step, in passing a comprehensive mental health regional funding bill. Uh, what's most important, though, I think, is making sure that children's mental health, mental health is fully funded so we can diagnose a lot of these problems early on before they become uh, too much. And finally, Carl is very right about the certificate of need. Um, I, I spearheaded this effort two years ago as a mental health uh, institution wanted to come into Bettendorf. And other mental health institutions in the country were seeing them being turned down repeatedly by this three-person bureaucracy. That was preventing any other mental health ward from thinking they were going to be able to get through that gatekeeper to come in and help mental health institutions here in Iowa. I ran a bill that threatened to just remove the certificate of need completely. Thankfully, they got the message. They removed that barrier, and that Bettendorf facility is being built, but I think that we need to send a clear message in Iowa that 
we're open for business. If you want to come here and open up Mental Health Ward, we'd love to have you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Mental health uh, in, in our state is, is currently, uh, our system's in a state of crisis. Uh, not only do we currently rank 49th in the country when it comes to the number of public mental health beds per capita, uh, the Medicaid privatization disaster has put uh, elevated pressure on the providers who do remain, who are in uh, private practice. Uh, you're seeing, uh, as, as Jody mentioned, uh, some of these group homes are being shut down. Uh, it's becoming more difficult for people to get discharged from an acute care bed where they might be uh, the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics being stepped down in that continuum of care. And so you have people waiting in the emergency room for 36, 48, 72 hours before they're actually able to even get any treatment in the first place. And so uh, one of the things that we have to do uh, is expand the number of public psychiatric beds that are available in the state. Uh, we have to, again, reverse Medicaid privatization. Uh, and, and I agree 100% with Representative Kaufman. We have to be taking a very serious look at children's mental health. Uh, I was very glad to see that Governor Reynolds finally added that to the purview of what she's working on. On, uh, but we need to do more, including uh, at the school district level. Uh, just last week in Clarence, I met with the folks at the junior senior high school. They're seeing a huge spike in anxiety, depression among teenagers. We have to take that very seriously. So I uh, work in a hospital over in Anamosa. It's pretty close to the prison, so we do get to see uh, firsthand uh, these instances. And <clears throat> it, it's a cost savings measure funding mental health. Prisons, hospitals are very expensive, but getting them the treatment that they need, getting children the treatment that they need, and, and really getting the stigma away from uh, people who have a mental health problem. Um, drug, a drug addicts, we need to get the uh, stigma away from them as well. We need to have things like needle exchange that puts drug addicts right in front of somebody that can help them out. When they go to exchange, they're right in front of pamphlets, they're right in front of people that can help them. And I think it's, it's proven to show that if you treat drug addiction as a mental health or a public health uh, situation instead of criminal justice, we all win. Thank you. How can the state help small farmers and those just beginning to farm? Are we starting with Jody? Um, well, you know, this is a question that I've been asking some of our FFA groups. How do people become farmers? How do you get a start? And there are so many barriers right now. Um, I love the organization that has just set up shop over in West Branch called Silt that is helping um, young farmers be able to come in and rent land to uh, keep it in the organic, sustainable farming area, allowing uh, long-term farmers that maybe don't have kids to take over their land to put that land into a permanent trust so that it can always be used as, as a sustainable agriculture. I think that there are, um, you know, we, we need to make sure that, that we can get a handle on the price of, of farmland because right now it is absolutely unobtainable for a for a new a new farmer to just go buy land and start it up. I was able to uh, chair the Young Farmers Initiative several years ago, and so I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. A lot of times, one of the biggest barriers for young farmers is their inability to pay extremely high rents as a farmer who has 4,000 acres and can leverage you know, crops over in the, uh, the Chicago Board of Trade. And so we passed a bill that still exists today that allows uh, for a tax credit, one of the, I think, the really good tax credits out there that exists that allows the beginning farmer to be competitive with someone who's been farming for 30 or 40 years. Um, I agree with Jody that SILT's a great organization. I'm actually a board member of it. Um, I think that investing in our local foods entities for people that don't just want to be a traditional farmer but instead want to raise uh, vegetables on two acres and make a good living, I think those folks, I, I've, I've had meetings with them and said that you don't have to have an adversary relationship with big ag versus small ag. I think that we can all coexist. And then finally, I think that livestock is a great entry. Uh, there's a lot, there's a big market uh, for all natural pork raised outside. That doesn't mean that we have to hate CAFOs. It doesn't mean that we have to hate someone that doesn't like CAFOs. I think that all of us that want to be in farming uh, can coexist together, particularly young farmers. Thank you. 
Yeah, I think you know there's probably some bipartisan agreement on this, which is uh, which is good. Uh, I think it's very important uh, for us to note that actually, I think last year was the first time uh, in the last 40 years that the average age of a farmer went down instead of went up. Um, and, and incidentally, that was the the same year that I think the average size of a farm went down instead of going up. Uh, and so you know that really does go part and parcel uh, in making sure that young farmers have the opportunity to farm on, on smaller acreages if they're farming vegetables, uh, livestock, uh, creating markets with some of the food hubs that are, are now being talked about as a, a kind of a central uh, point of exchange for uh, especially young vegetable farmers. Uh, I think that's something that's really exciting. Um, and, you know, again, part of it is making sure that uh, farmers have access to credit. Uh, part of the challenge is that we're in a very turbulent, you know, uh, kind of commodity price driven um, international market. And so I think banks are often hesitant to lend uh, to farmers who are trying to buy land. Uh, and that's where I think there is that cash flow that comes with livestock, where that, that often is where you can actually you can get a loan to, to make that happen. Uh, but if, you, if you're not interested in livestock, I think it can be hard to, to get into to farming if you're a young person. Um, well, I, <clears throat> I think uh, it really comes down to supporting our community colleges. Farming's a highly skilled trade. You have to be good at biology. You have to be good at uh, maintenance. You have to be good at uh, uh, handling money. And uh, our community colleges are really putting forward uh, the students and the people uh, that uh, have those skills. So if you want to help out uh, uh, future farmers, I do think that the community colleges are really the people that are already doing the work to uh, help uh, bring skilled uh, workers forward. And you can really kill two birds with one stone with that because we already have a, a skilled worker shortage. We, uh, 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 when funding education, I do think that, you know, uh, if, if you have any left over afterwards, you, you really should look into the community colleges because uh, they, uh, they do the work already that the legislators want to do, so. I, know, I don't only think we need to go to community colleges. I, I like what's happened here in uh, Johnson County with uh, uh, the Iowa City Schools and uh, Clear Creek Amana, both starting FFA programs this uh, year. Highland has started one a year ago. Uh, we need to educate kids about agricultural type jobs here in Iowa. Uh, and people need to know where the food comes from. Uh, some of the things uh, that I think is, is, is good that we are doing right is the, the tax credits and putting a established farmer who does not, not have any heirs uh, with a young farmer and uh, allowing that person to work w with that young farmer to uh, get them established and started. Uh, local foods are great. There's, there's many different types of farmers uh, you can probably go down the road here and, and uh, between here and uh, Washington and find 50 different types of operations. Thank you. So the question is written is, as an elected official, what do you feel is your most sacred duty to help your district? And if you feel awkward talking about your most sacred duty, maybe if you could author one bill next year, what would it be and why? And are we with Bob? Sorry. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I don't remember either. I get confused. Um, yeah. I think that my most sacred duty to my constituents by far is what I've been doing the last six years, and that is voting with an independent mind. You'll hear a lot of noise on Facebook and in the editorial board of the, of the newspapers, but I have the single, single biggest voting, independent voting record in the state of Iowa in either chamber in either party. I've made my speaker nearly pull her hair out. I've made the Democrats mad. I figure if I'm making both parties mad, I'm doing my job. And I think that is a service that I owe to my constituents in a district that's very split. I think I've delivered on that. And as far as the bill that's most important to me next year, I'm torn. Because on the education side, I really am interested in making sure the SAVE bill passes. But it also tears at my heart shrinks to chair the Oversight Committee and look at all the reforms that we need in DHS to make sure that another young girl is not killed again. Thank you. You know, it's a big word, uh, sacred. You know, I think, you know, our, our, our politics is obviously in a very tough place right now. I think all of us can agree, Democrat, Republican, Independent, Libertarian, uh, that, that politics is, um, I think a lot of people feel frustrated, people feel angry, uh, people feel scared. 
Uh, and so I think probably the most sacred responsibility is to just approach this job with compassion and, and an understanding that we may not see issues eye to eye, uh, but that we, we don't have to be mean about it. We don't have to bully people about it. Um, and, and, and I, you know, I, I remember what it feels, I know what it feels like to be afraid of your government. I know what it feels like to be afraid of, of politicians who, who don't include you or your family in their vision for the future of our state or our country. And I will make sure that I will do my best. I think it is my sacred responsibility uh, as a state you know, legislator to make sure that every person in this district knows that you will have in me somebody who will fight for you no matter who you are, what your family looks like, where you come from, uh, and, and that I will always listen to you uh, no matter what. Thank you. Carl? Um, well, everything's connected to the economy for me. Uh, everything needs to be paid for. So whether it's education, whether it's uh, health care, whether it's water quality, every single one of these things needs to be paid for. And we can't do that without a thriving economy. So that's why I'm really pushing forward these new revenue streams. That's why I'm pushing for marijuana legalization. That's why I'm pushing for uh, casinos, uh, more casinos in Iowa. That's why I'm pushing for things like sports betting. Uh, Without a thriving economy, we can't uh, spend money on even the most basic things, like making sure that others are protected from harm. So we need that thriving economy to pay for all of the things that we hold dear and important. Kevin? Well, I'm going to go back to, to my opening. Being able to work with the other party across the aisle, that That is our job. We need to, if the Republicans have a good piece of policy, it shouldn't be looked at as that's a Republican bill. It shouldn't be looked at as a Democratic bill. That's why I have co-authored many pieces of legislation with a, a Republican. So it takes that out of it. It's not a Republican or, or a Democratic thing. The one thing that I would like to see is the, the industrial hemp uh, legislation next year. We, we've worked on that because I do think it can create jobs here in rural Iowa. It can give farmers that alternative crop in which they can raise. Uh, hemp is, uh, there are 25,000 different uses for industrial hemp. Everything from food to fiber to um, uh, rope is what most people know it as. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, my number one issue would be campaign finance reform. I don't think there's probably anybody in this room that's thinking that we could use a few more negative ads on TV. I think that there is so much noise coming out of coming out of Washington, coming out of Des Moines, that just keeps people in this state of, I don't want to be involved in politics. It's too negative. I think that we have to do some serious work on limiting contributions from individuals here in Iowa. Right now, legislative candidates can have unlimited amounts of money from anybody, from any one individual. Um, I think that we need to get to a point where we can all talk about politics again and getting the corrupting influence of money out will allow us to do that. Thank you. Um, we'll do one more question and then we'll do closing statements. Um, do you guys want to summarize how you feel about gun control? I know, wait, I'm sorry, where are we starting? I'm totally lost. I think, I think I'm up. I think it's Zach, <coughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. sorry. <coughs> So I, I shot uh, growing up. I, I shot rifles, shotguns, revolvers uh, growing up in the Boy Scouts. And I'm, I'm you know, old enough to remember when uh, the NRA was mostly focused on actually training people on how to use uh, firearms responsibly. And, and I think you know, part of what I learned is that uh, if you're going to treat firearms responsibly, part of that means having responsible laws. And it starts with enforcing the laws that we already have on the books. Uh, I think making sure that we have universal background checks that are actually being enforced. Uh, I think that there are things that we can do to make it more difficult for bad actors who, who are not 
uh, interested in using firearms legally to get their hands on weapons uh, in ways that won't compromise the rights of people who are law-abiding citizens. Um, and I, I do think that part of what we have to do is make sure that we're electing uh, lawmakers who, who do have an, an understanding of, of what firearms are and how they're used um, and uh, kind of what specifications may be. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's clear that the laws that we have uh, on the books are, are not adequate. Uh, historically in the state, we had uh, fairly strong gun safety laws, but we've been moving in the wrong direction over the last two years. And so um, I, I think that we have to take a, a much closer look at where things are. Thank you. Carl? So, uh, you know, to me, no bill is going to protect you from your own firearm. Uh, so just, you know, with my uh, nephews learning about uh, guns, I, I just want to state, you know, always treat every firearm as though it's loaded. Um, always keep the muzzle pointed in a safe direction. Keep your finger outside of the trigger area until you're ready to fire. Always be sure of what's in front of your target and what's behind it. And really, if you, if you follow those guidelines, that takes care of the majority of, of accidents. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm not a big fan of uh, uh, background checks. I don't think they work. The Cincinnati, Ohio shooter, the Parkland, Florida shooter, Texas church shooting, Las Vegas County shooting, Orlando, Florida shooting, San Bernardino, Fort Hood 1 and 2, every single one of those people passed a background check. I don't think that background checks are the answer, but I do think that we can up the security in our gun-free zones like our schools. Thank you. Kevin? Well, this is something that I carry it again all the time. Uh, I am not opposed to law-abiding citizens having a gun, but there are things that I am opposed to. It is. It is absurd that we can go online and take an online course when you have no idea uh, who is actually taking that course and get a certificate to be able to carry a gun. We need to be able to show some type of proficiency that uh, if you are carrying a gun, you know how to use that gun. I always use, and I and I spoke about it on the floor, a woman coming into the sheriff's office with a pink Glock wanting to know how to operate this gun. She's pointing it at me when I go out there to talk to her. I take her back and find out that she took an online course in how to, in, in a, in a, is, has the ability to carry that gun. She didn't know how to make the gun safe. Uh, we need to show some type of proficiency in guns along with backgrounds. Um, I support the Second Amendment. I grew up with guns in my household. I believe um, that you can't legislate away bad guys getting guns, but I think there are so many ways that we can make a safer society for all of us in terms of education in our school systems. Your kid may not ever see a gun at your house, but that's not saying that they're going to find one on the park or in a public space. I think we need to be um, you know, expanding our background checks. Um, I do disagree with Carl on that, that um, they need to be more accessible and communicate with a lot more departments, have the ability to flag if law enforcement sees an issue, if uh, mental health professionals see an issue. I would also like to see us uh, do some serious research into why our kids are shooting each other at schools. Um, I, I fully believe it's a mental health issue, but we need to be able to study this. I, and I know there's so much fear wrapped around it that it's going to result in banning guns. And I think that, um, again, money and politics, we've got to get the noise out so that we can all sit together and rationalize have this conversation because I haven't met a responsible gun owner yet that didn't agree that there's some improvements that can be made. As a staunch advocate of our Second Amendment, <clears throat> I've reached out to many Democrats on this issue, and there are lots of areas where we have common ground. Uh, people who are violent domestic offenders uh, should not be allowed to have guns. Background checks are a good thing. Carl's right. Educating people on the safety issues is a good thing. But a lot of the gun control bills that I see come through the Iowa legislature give people a false sense of security. I have never met a criminal, nor would I challenge anybody in this room who's ever met a criminal that said, you know what, I really wanted to go perform this violent crime with this gun, but ah, shucks, legislature changed section 311.256 of the code. Gosh darn it, I can't go do that now. No criminal follows that type of thing. And the bottom line is we need, to, we need to make sure that people are educated, that we have background checks, but you have a constitutional right to protect yourselves and your family and to just flippantly p toss bills out that completely spit in the face of that for a false sense of security is not a good thing. 
All right. Um, each candidate will now have two minutes to make a closing statement. Do you guys want to start with Zach or start with Carl? Is that where we are in the rotation? Sorry. Yeah, sure. All right. <laughs> we'll start with Carl. So, as politicians, we need to appreciate each other's ability and knowledge rather than bullying each other just because we have an R, a D, or an L by our name. Uh, citizens as well as future generations need to see that we can discuss and debate issues without unnecessary negativity. I have not always been successful in this, but as a, a father, I have to make sure that I'm setting a good example for my children. Uh, we also have to acknowledge that Iowa has limited resources. We're losing population to states with lower taxes. We're funding things barely anyone cares about, which takes away from things that everyone cares about. I care about education. I care about my children's generation growing up better off than those before it. When we spend, send people to jail for marijuana, that's money we're not spending on education. When we deny casinos a license, that's revenue that doesn't go to our mental health crisis. When we don't allow healthcare facilities to open or expand, we're making patients pay more. And when we don't allow for sports betting, that's revenue that we won't use to clean our water. When we invest in expensive green energy instead of cheaper, safer, and more reliable alternatives, we're taking more money out of the pockets of the poor. And when we give your money to well-off companies, that ensures that the best product, the best service, or the best quality can't compete with the business that has the most well-connected friends. Our laws, regulations, and elections have consequences. I'm Carl Cranbeck, and I'm asking for your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin Kenny. Iowa is facing tough issues. Those issues need people with the experience working across the aisle and getting things done for our Iowa families. I have spent my career working with everyone, <laughs> keeping people safe. I have worked across the aisle, and I will continue to work across the aisle in my second term. I want to thank everyone for coming, and I hope I can earn your vote this November. Mm -hmm. Jody? Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, I dream of an Iowa where everybody gets to participate in the same economy. It is not right that people are working 40 plus hours, sometimes two and three jobs, and still can't afford to pay their bills. I don't think that our current legislators understand what it's like to literally spend hours and hours away from your children and still not be able to pay your bills. We've got to do something about the minimum wage in this state. We need to make sure that everybody can participate in the economy. Healthcare, the rising cost of healthcare is a big part of that um, so many people are forced to work for large corporations because they offer better benefits. Small business owners are being hurt by this because they can't hire and retain quality workers because they can't offer the benefits that other places can because of the costs. I would like to see us open up the Medicaid system to anyone that would like to buy in, uh, entrepreneurs, small business owners, employees of small business owners. It's not free. It's not socialized medicine. It's spreading the risk pool. I've worked on both sides of insurance. I've worked in healthcare. I have also worked in finance. We need to get more people in so that we can share the risk uh, of the healthcare system. Um, and finally, Please get involved more in your local politics. We need more people's voices, not less. Um, I encourage all of you to reach out to your representatives with issues that you're passionate about. While I have my issues that I you know, feel pretty comfortable with, there are so many more issues that I have been talking to people over the last 18 months that I had no idea were even on the radar. So please continue to bring your passions to, to your representatives, because they may not know um, that, that that's an issue either. Um, I hope to earn your vote for District 73 this November. Um, early voting has already begun. I believe that uh, you know my job as a, as a legislator would be to amplify your voices up to the state house, not to tell you how things should be done. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. And I want to thank the League and all of you for being here tonight. Uh, I'm going to repeat myself because I think it's worth repeating. I think the number one thing that I want to leave with people tonight is the fact that of all 150 people in the state of Iowa that represent you, I have the single most independent voting record in the state of Iowa. I think that's important. 
It results in things like EMS funding, mental health bills, and combating opioid crisis. I'm proud of the work that we've done in the Oversight Committee, working as both Democrats and Republicans, particularly fighting for abused kids, fighting for property rights, and working to reform DHS. In fact, I want to compliment, want to take some of my time and compliment one of our local legislators, Representative Vicki Lensing, who has worked with me hand in hand and has been a treasurer on the Oversight Committee. I break with my party often. I did it just this last year in medical cannabis. I believe that we need a robust and expanded medical cannabis program. I broke with my party and voted with Democrats on animal cruelty. I think our animal cruelty laws in this state are a joke. And finally, I want to end with agreeing with my opponent. Because Jody has said that one party control is a bad thing. And I completely agree. Because right now in Johnson County, you have seven Democratic legislators and me. And I think that it's important to the balance of the people of House District 73 in Johnson County that you've got one representative who's willing to work with all seven of those Democrats to not have one party control here in Johnson County. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. And Zach? Yeah, I'll start again by, by thanking the league and, and the folks who were able to participate in our democracy and come out tonight to ask us the questions that, that you wanted to, to have answered. Um, you know, I'm also thinking about the topics that we didn't get to tonight, uh, things like housing, uh, which is an issue here in Coralville, just as much as it is out in Clarence. The economic development, uh, which requires a new approach, uh, whether you're in an urban area or a rural area, uh, the opioid epidemic and 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 our, our suicide rate, which was um, which is in the, the news recently. Uh, I'm sure some of you heard uh, that the Iowa City Community School District lost two teachers um, in uh, in unrelated incidents uh, recently, um, and and so making sure that we're continuing the conversation about the challenges and the pressures that so many people are facing right now is very important. Um, but there are also other things like uh, child care, which I hear about again and again when I'm out knocking on doors, or the need for a universal pre-K program. So there are, there are many more things uh, that are facing our state and, and that we, we need people who are willing to get in there uh, to work across the aisle if necessary, to work within your own party. Sometimes that's hard, too, uh, to roll your sleeves up and, and get the work done. Uh, in addition to being an advocate for the LGBT community and leading a national campaign to end discrimination in the Boy Scouts of America, I've also been a small business owner and an entrepreneur. Uh, whenever you're in that role, you have to think really hard about the problems that you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. You have to be able to, to find new solutions, things that people haven't necessarily thought of before. And that's something that I'm, I'm hoping to do as your next day senator. Uh, and again, I also want to, to go back to something that I mentioned briefly earlier, is this, this need for compassion uh, in, in our politics again. Uh, you know, we are at a time when, when more Democrats hate Republicans and more Republicans hate Democrats than any time in, in our country's history. Uh, and I think that we can all agree that we don't, we don't want our politics to become a ratchet. We don't want it to just get worse and worse and worse. And I don't have the answer for you. I don't, I don't know uh, how, how we break through this. Uh, but, but I know that we don't do it by, by bullying other people, by putting other people down. Uh, I think that we have to, to get back to, to what statesmanship and, and what politics is supposed to be about, which is listening to the people and figuring out how we could all move forward together, because we all do better when we all do better. Uh, my name is Zach Walls. I'm asking for your vote for Senate District 37. Uh, and if you want to get involved, we've got a lot more information outside. We've only got three weeks left, and we'd love to have you join us out on the doors. Thank you. I want to give a huge thank you to our candidates. I know it's not easy to get up in front of the TV and have one minute to try and get your answers out. Thank you guys so much for participating. Um, I want to thank everybody who's come, everybody who's involved, um, everybody who's going to go out and vote. Remember to vote before November 6th. Um, and just a reminder that the views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates and that sponsorship of the forum is not an endorsement of any candidate. Um, also a reminder, the League of Women Voters is open to anyone 16 and older. We'd love to have you join us. Thank you so much.